Good morning. Well, good morning, everyone. There we are. Welcome to Shores Community Church on this beautiful day. We're so thankful today that we get to gather as the people of God and enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise because he's worthy of our worship. Amen? All right, would you stand? I want to pray for us as we enter in today. God, we thank you for this place that we get to come. We thank you that you have invited us because you want us to draw near. And you know, you've, you've told us that there's power in just spending time in your presence. So we want to set aside the things that weigh on us of this world because you have them. They are held in your hand and under your control. And we want to give you our full attention and bring all of our heart to you in worship now. Inhabit our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.
His faithfulness is amazing. Amen. We want to teach you a new song today. And it's called Yahweh, but it's based off of Psalm 84. And that's actually the passage that Pastor Nate's new sermon series is going to be kind of rooted in. And so I just wanted to read a chunk of Psalm 84 so that you could see where these lyrics were pulled from. So it says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Father, we thank you for these words that you've given us to guide how we approach you that welcome us in. And now we just want to turn around and sing these words back to you. For you are great and we long just to be with you and to understand more of the power that there is found in your presence receive our praise now. Amen. I'd rather be than seated in the presence of my King. You're the only one I'd rather be. Your majesty is all I want to see. All I want is you.
fall down. Jesus, we're so thankful that you are seated on your throne. And that even as you sit in perfect holiness, you invite us to draw near to you. That because of the power of your blood, you've washed us. And you see us through your sacrifice. You see us as pure. We'll never comprehend the magnitude of that. I just pray now that our worship has been a sweet aroma, a pleasing sound. May you just get all the honor, glory, praise that is due to you, our risen, holy, reigning King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, fourth and fifth graders, you are free to head to your class. And everyone else, go ahead and say hey to someone around you before you have a seat.
see that? We're having a church potluck. <laughs> you know, it's been a while, really. I mean, we that's something that we just can't, you don't really do anymore, church potlucks. You want to know the truth? We had a lot of meat let, left over from the wild game dinner, and we froze it up. <laughs> We're like, what are we going to do with all this ground up venison? Let's have a potluck. So you're all invited, yeah? Hey, men in the room, we have men's night Tomorrow night, it's fun, we worship, we learn, and we do some type of competition, so eat a lot of good food, check that out. 7 o'clock, tomorrow night, right here. We also have upcoming Shores, Cares, Cares and Shares, Shores, Cares and Shares Service Week, and this is really near and dear to me, because we, we as a church, we don't need to take on more community initiatives I think we as a church just need to step alongside some of the agencies and some of the initiatives that are happening, already happening in our county. And my hope is, is that during this week, you'll be exposed to different things that are happening and how you can, after this week is over, continue to serve and bless these places. And this particular week, we're, we're looking at children at risk. And I care about this. My wife and I have been foster parents for several years, and we have seen what kids go through. We have seen kids being removed from homes, right? They get brought to McDonald's to get some chicken nuggies, and then they show up at your house at about 10 o'clock at night, and here you go, put them to bed. And the last placement, they came with nothing, with nothing. No shoes, like, well, they had shoes, but they didn't fit. Clothes didn't fit, nothing. And I, I care deeply about this, that we support these agencies that are on behalf of, really serving on behalf of these kiddos, okay? So we're, one of the days, we're just writing thank you cards to the foster care workers. Because we've seen several cycle through because it's a hard job, and you see a lot of difficult things. Look at the face of that caseworker when one of our foster children were disclosing things. I, it, it is something that they carry as they look at some of the turmoil that kids go through and just the innocence of their lives. So, I could talk all day about this as a passion of mine, but we're going to be helping children at risk, and I want you to jump in, okay? And there's all kinds of different things you can do and donate and bless. And hopefully at the end of this, you as a family can adopt one of these, one of these agencies, one of these, one of these groups that are helping people, and then you can continue to bless, and, and all that information's on there. Okay. When you see a house that looks like this, what do you think? Detroit. Detroit. <laughs> That's just not fair, man. You're not wrong, just not fair. Okay. I mean, it, it looks rough, doesn't it? It needs a new porch, new roof, new windows, new siding, new doors, new lawn. Who, who all would say just tear it down and start over, right? But this is how we think, right? We notice, we notice places and then we, look how, we, we notice how places and then we think about how it looks and then we make judgments based on that. But this is the same house. Fixed up. Same house. Same structure. They probably tore it all down to the studs. But same structure. Now what, you, now what do you think when you look at this house? You think somebody's really committed. <laughs> Maybe had deep pockets. And we, and we make assumptions that if the exterior looks this nice, well, then the interior must be beautiful. It, this is human nature. I think we also do this when it comes to just how we live. We, we focus a lot on the exterior because that's what people see. And maybe, maybe we neglect the interior. And that's a temptation. Because, hey, I, I, I got to keep up appearances. We ask questions like, uh, what will people think of me? So we, 
We really focus on the outside of us, and maybe, maybe we overlook the inside. Now, Jesus has words for you, okay? Jesus, Jesus was very direct, and he, he had a, a, really, a, I would say, a harsh rebuke towards the religious leaders, the, the Pharisees. At the, now, the, these people had this holier-than-thou vibe. They were, I'm better than you attitude. They, they really cared about what people thought, and Jesus said this. So, do you ever picture Jesus as being this, like, really nicey, nicey, mamby, pamby kind of guy? Is that how you picture Jesus? Because I don't, because I read passages like this, and I know at times, I mean, he'll tell you the truth. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside, you're full of greed and indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. But he doesn't stop there. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites, You're like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you're full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. This is to a religious leader, a Pharisee, who really cared about their purity. He's saying, yeah, you might be keeping the purity laws, but the inside of you is dead. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be people as to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So what does Jesus really care about? Well, he cares about the inside of you, at least equally as important as the outside of you. Because if your inside isn't right, then whatever you show to the people around you, well, that's just, that's hypocrisy. That's, it's not real. It's not genuine. Jesus cares about your secret life with God. Reminds me of that cartoon, right? The secret life of pets. What happens behind closed doors? But, but if God could open the door to your heart, right, what would he see in there? And listen, listen, this is important. God can open that door, and he does. So what's on the inside of you? Now, this morning I want to give you good news. You want to hear good news? Can you smile? I'm giving you good news. Smile. Some of you are like, nope, I'm not going to smile. Fine. Don't smile. But it's still good news. This work that needs to happen on the inside of us, God does with us. You meet with the Father, the Holy Spirit shows up, and He does all this hard work. You become a different person. He's doing this with you. The Holy Spirit cleans the inside of your cup. All you have to do is meet with Him. So I want to spend the next several weeks talking about having that secret life with God. Morning, noon, and night, a passionate, alive relationship with God. Not dull, not dead, not lifeless, alive. And I'm talking about the unseen part of you. Only God can see it, but it will come out. What's on the inside of you will eventually come out. So let's do the heart work. All right, grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 84. If you don't have a Bible, we provide one for you. It's in the chair in front of you. And I've given you the page number so you can turn there quickly. Let's all read God's Word together, right? The only source of truth in a very dark and depraved world, God's Word. Psalm 84. Let's start reading in verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Psalmist pretty passionate about having a relationship with God, isn't he? Really cares about it. He wants to spend time with God. And you you see this language of of courts and altar, dwelling place. So to the psalmist, 
people at this, like in this Old Testament, this time, they would meet with God at a location, right? The, the temple. But now, because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we can meet with God anywhere and everywhere. Stephen talks about this. He says, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. So you can meet with God anywhere, everywhere. In the craziness of your day, you can still just block off a little bit of time to meet with God. You, I'm going to show you some really awkward pictures, okay? Same guy, same star of every one of these pictures. You can meet with God in your living room at the couch. My kids tease me because that's my couch. Does everyone have like their spot in the house? They tease me because I got a buck groove in that couch where I settle right in. But you can meet with God in the car while you're driving. There, okay, there's a trend here. There's the same face in every one of these pictures, okay? Or you can meet with God in the woods. Anywhere, because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God, if the Holy Spirit's there, God is there, and guess where? The Holy Spirit's everywhere, anywhere. People struggle with this because they wonder, like, do I have to be at church to meet with God, or maybe I have to be in my prayer room to meet with God? Those are all good options. Just keep adding to them. The woman at the well had a question for Jesus about connecting with God. And she asked, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but the Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And then Jesus said, woman, <laughs> I'm just wondering if you can try that on your wife. <laughs> well, Jesus did it, right? <laughs> woman, <laughs> if you try that, duck, quick, okay? <laughs> Something's flying at your head. Woman, <laughs> woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Anywhere, everywhere, you can have this vibrant, alive, passionate relationship with God. And you can find a home with God. The psalmist is passionate about, about being in that, that temple, enjoying the presence of God. The presence of God can be in that car when you're driving to work. The presence of God can be in the bathroom when you're just shutting the door because you've got some crazies outside, beating on it, going, Dad, Mom, 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 I don't know where you find peace in your life. It might actually have to be this. Shut door locked. Leave me alone for like 10 minutes, please. It could be anywhere. When we read the psalm, we see that the psalmist sees God as a living God. And, and this, this really settled hard in my heart when I was over in Thailand because I saw a lot of this. I mean, just one Buddha statue after another. And basically, that's just a hunk of copper. And what really gripped me is that they're worshiping a dead idol. There's no life to this. But we have a living God, which means that if you have emotions, God also has emotions. God has passions. You have passions. You become sad. God is grieved. And when you pray, he hears you because he's alive and he's active and he's all-powerful and he responds to your prayers so if you're praying, God, just please touch the heart of my child, God's saying, yep, I want your child to love me too. He hears you. He feels with you. That doesn't feel a thing. But God's living. He's active. The psalmist goes on to say, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage as they pass through the Valley of Baca. So what is the Valley of Baca? That, that's the Valley of Weeping, okay? They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. 
they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. The valley of weeping. That painful, that difficult place in life. You know, I found that there's many people in this room and you're in that valley of weeping. It's difficult. It sucks your strength. Maybe you just feel dry. Maybe your lips are patched, you know, parched and you're cracked and you just, just you need some refreshment. And that's the Lord. He gives you strength. But I also find that there's probably many, many people in this room and you're coming out of that kind of valley, that difficulty, and you just need that added strength. And I love how this is worded, from strength to strength. It's like, okay, I, I feel uplifted by God, but then I, I, I go into a new season of trial or tribulation and I, I just tears me down a little bit, but then God gives me new strength and refreshes me. Okay, there's some of you in this room and you're like, life is good. Amen. Some of you. Is there anybody in this room that is like, life is good. Uh, all right, now you're heading into the Valley of Baca. No, I'm just, <laughs> you know that there will be trial and struggle and difficulties. We all experience it. Amen. And so that's why we need a passionate, a live relationship with God because it's sustaining. And he will bring you home. How many of you want to be close to God like this psalmist? You want it? The psalmist says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I don't want to even be near him. I want to be close to the Lord. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. The Lord Almighty blesses the one who trusts in you. I want this. I want this relationship with God. Do you want it? And if we want it, well, how do we have it? That's what I want to talk about. How do we have this kind of walk with God? And I got some keys. And, and again, this is the beginning of a series. I really, I'm passionate about this because I believe the inside of you is so important. What's going on in here where people can't see it, it's what Jesus cared about. So how do we have this passionate relationship, live relationship with God? Well, first, we need the key, and I have several keys here, the key of feeling wanted. So if we're going to come to God and we're going to have a relationship with God, we actually, we need to, we need to feel that God actually wants us or likes us. Because I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I wasn't the nicest kid or I wasn't, I was kind of naughty. So most authority figures did not like me. They tolerated me, but they didn't like me. I knew the principal on first name basis, but not for good reasons. Not because I was on, you know, student congress or anything like that. <laughs> I, I was... I was in trouble a lot, and sometimes when I approach my relationship with God, that's how I feel, like I'm in trouble again, that God really doesn't want me or like me. And Satan, he's called the accuser, and Satan does not want you to come close to God. He doesn't. He wants you to feel like garbage, like you messed up, you're ugly, that God has no time for you. He wants to put that in your head because he knows that if you meet with God, there's victory. You meet with God, you'll look different. You meet with God, the Holy Spirit will start changing you. He doesn't want that. So he keeps trying to remind you you're no good. So I have an activity for you, okay? When you get into this time with God, I want you to speak the blood of Christ over your guilt and sin. Because it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you. So you're going to spend some time with God and maybe you don't feel like you should because you, you just don't feel good about yourself. And you just say, oh, you know what? Blood of Jesus Christ over my life, over these thoughts, over everything. Because it is truly Christ's sacrifice on the cross that has purchased and provided a way for you to have a relationship with God. It's not you. It's what's been done for you. And you could just say, God wants me. He accepts me. 
because of Jesus. They triumphed over him, the him being Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So speak it. And when you feel those, just say, no, nope, blood of Jesus Christ. I am righteous before God because of Jesus. Next, I, I think we just have to say yes to this time and this relationship with God. The key of just saying yes. See, I see meeting with God kind of like sitting down at a table. God has pushed out the chair. Again, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you can now sit down and meet with him. I know some of you, some of you guys, some of you ladies in the room, you're so busy that maybe the time with God is in your car while you're driving to work. Well, just let God sit in the passenger seat and just talk to him because he's welcoming you in. It'll make you a different driver. You might actually be able to tolerate people on the road if you know Jesus is in the car with you. you know, now i got to watch how I talk about the other drivers because Jesus is right here, you know? But I really believe this is just time with him anywhere, all the time. And I have some elements to add to this, like the key of just the shut door. When you're going to have a serious conversation with somebody, what do you do? When you, want, you really want to talk to somebody and you're maybe in like a business environment, what do you do? Shut the door. Like the open door conversations are like, hey, how you doing? How was your weekend? All good? Yeah, good. But when you walk in or when the boss walks in and shuts the door, it's going to get real, Right? <laughs> And I think this spiritual idea of just shutting the door can happen any time, all the time. When you pray, go into your room and close the door. I think we can do that in whatever's happening around us. Like in the morning, I'm I'm making my smoothie, fruit smoothie, because I'm old like that. Isn't that embarrassing? Like no more hash browns, eggs, bacon, sausage. I'm making a fruit smoothie with a banana, some blueberries, and a, a cup of protein, you know, like. It's sad. It's sad. It's sad that I'm at that place in life that I have to eat. But I'm sitting there by, by the mixer making up my fruit smoothie, and I can close the door. I shut the door, and I spend time with God. Do you see how simple that is? I come home. After a day, church, church stuff, I sit down on my my favorite couch, you saw it, right? I showed it to you, and I shut the door just for a little bit of time to pray, to shut that door. I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old on the, you know, on the rug in front of me tearing each other apart, okay? Acting like two little dummies, just wrestling and breaking into things, oh, I guess I can't say dummies. I'm sorry. Cancel culture. I don't know how to police myself yet, so I'm sorry. Things just come out of me sometimes. But they're just wrestling all over the place. But I can shut that door and just say, all right, God, help me be a father and disciple these kids. You understand? It can be anywhere, all the time, whatever's happening in life. Next, the key of standing. So, when we're saying yes to this time with God, we have to give Him our attention and be alert and be focused on Him. And in the Scriptures, they use the, they use the imagery of standing. They speak of the Levites. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi. They tasked Him to carry the Ark of the Covenant, but also to stand before the Lord and to minister and to pronounce blessings in His name, as they still do today. The, the Levites, they stood before God. They gave him his attention. Just remember, your first ministry is to the Lord. You, you pray, you have a relationship with him. You care for him first. So stand. Give him everything you got. Stand. To 
despite the warfare, the resistance, the hassles, the weariness, the stresses, the, despite the temptations, personal failures, loneliness, even when you feel like you're chained down, stand anyways, okay? Stand. Give God your attention. Now, I came across this verse. Gabriel, when he showed himself to Mary, he described himself. Look how he described himself. He said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Isn't that interesting? Like, Gabriel, as you describe yourself, what are you about? I stand in the presence of God. No, no, Gabriel, seriously, what makes you so cool? Let me see your sword, right? If you can see an angel, wouldn't you want to see a sword? And just say, how many demons have you killed with this sword? Okay, Gabriel, give, give me some stories. And Gabriel says, I stand before the presence of God. That's what I'm about. God has my full attention. And then sometimes he sends me on errands. But listen, I am about him. I'm alert to him. Stand. You know, it, any doers in the room, like you just can't sit still. Anyone like that? I, I cannot sit still. I sit still and immediately I want to jump up and do something. And I think doing something, right, feels better than just standing. We even have a phrase, don't just stand there, do something. God's saying, no, 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 stop doing stuff and stand. Well, I got I to gotta fix this. I got to do something. No, no, no. The work I want to do is actually inside of you. I change the inside of you, it's going to change everybody else around you. So just stand there. That's hard, though. It's so hard. Part of saying yes is, is really the key of time. You have to give God time. If you're going to have a passionate, alive relationship with God, if you're going to cultivate the secret life with God, you've got to sacrifice. You're going to have to sacrifice entertainment, vegging out on Netflix. You might, maybe you cannot watch a whole miniseries in one day. You're going to have to just cut things out, maybe even sometimes good things, because your first ministry is to the Lord. And that relationship that you have with Him. Now, I do want to talk about the danger of performance spirituality. Because we get into a topic like this, and we talk about a relationship with God, and may, immediately... Some of you, you know, eager people out there are like, okay, so I guess I just got to up my time. I got to meet a quota. All right, pastor, what's the quota I have to do? No, it, just put that out of your head. You are building in time with God, however that looks. And sometimes you, it's just going to be while you're going. And you get these brief moments. Sometimes you can actually block out time. There's different rhythms to life. There's different seasons to life. The point is, is that you are just, it's an inner work that's happening within you, and you know what's going on inside of you, right? You do know. Maybe you try to hide or avoid it, but you know that what's going on. And if we neglect this secret life with God, we're the ones that suffer. God's not disappointed with you. He's disappointed for you. Because you've missed out. You missed out on, on really what the Christian life's all about. So give them some time. Next, I want to talk about the key of so the key of sowing. Because again, for people who just like immediate results, especially for people who are have those ADHD minds. Anyone out there have that mind? ADHD mind that's constantly moving all the time? Okay, I do. And I like, I want to see something happen quickly, so I'll pray, and if it doesn't happen quickly, I'll move on to something else. I guess i got to try something else. It didn't work. But Paul builds in this imagery of sowing, which really means you're investing to, into your spirit, your inner person. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. So if you keep sowing into the Spirit, right, your investment will lead to eternal life, which is life to the fullest now, 
that continues on forever, right, into eternity. So don't relax the pursuit. Pursue God. You know, that's what happens in marriages, by the way. A marriage suffers because while you're dating, then you're really into each other, and you're pursuing each other, and you finish each other's sentences, and you call each other all the time. You're like, oh, I love you. Then you get married, and you're like, okay, whatever, you know? And you become partners, not lovers. Same thing happens in relationships, your relationship with God if you stop pursuing Him. Don't relax. Keep investing. And if you do, this is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's good. And we do get brief moments of happiness in this really, really messed up world that we're a part of. But joy, that's deep. You want joy, people, listen. Peace, patience, I just want a little bit of patience. Believe it or not, I idle a little high. Do you believe that? In my life, I'm not down those low RPMs. I'm idling a little bit higher than that. And I'm just right there all the time, just ready to like, ah. I just, I want a little bit of peace and patience. Amen? Invest in that. Sow into the Spirit about your secret life with God. Next, the key of humility. The key of humility. There are qualities that God is looking for. These are the ones I look for and look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit, who tremble at my word. God's looking for someone who's humble and willing to listen. You ever get around someone who's prideful or stubborn? Do you ever know someone who's stubborn? It's a good time not to look at your spouse. Just keep your eyes focused right up here on me. Don't look to the left or right. So, stubborn, right? Prideful. If you're prideful, you're not willing to hear or listen. It's one of my all-time favorite verses, 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I want that to be me. Hey, kids, teens in the room, listen to me. It doesn't matter your age. This is what God's looking for right here. And, and really, it's just a heart attitude. It's just a heart saying, God, show me what to do and I'll do it. I want to hear from you. This, this is more than hitting like 20 or 30 home runs. This is bigger and better than getting straight A's and getting a full scholarship. Sorry, parents. I guess I have to say it, all right? Teens, kids, this right here, you want God to look at you. Because your heart is committed. It doesn't matter the age. And I just got a simple prayer for us. Lord, I'm empty without you. I'm broken without your wholeness. I'm helpless without your strength. I'm clueless without your wisdom. Apart from you, I'm nothing. I need you. I need you so desperately that I've come here to pour out my heart to you again and again and again. You can just pray a prayer like that. All right, I got one more. I got one more key. And then I'm going to finish us up. The key of radiating God's light. See, it's important to understand that when you start doing the inner work, the inside that people can't see, your whole self becomes filled with light. And then you begin to glow. You get to shine that light out to the people around you. Jesus talks about this. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light, no part of it is dark. It'll be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. You ever get one of those night lights that glow? We have one of those that you can press on and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And that's, that's the imagery I have in my head as I think about this. When you become full of light, it shines out. People get to see it. You're the source of hope. You're the source of joy, peace, patience, gentleness, love. Truth. Man, 
It affect everybody else around you. So, again, I want to take down this idea that, that time with God is, is only just in this one sliver of time you give them, maybe in the morning or in the evening. It definitely includes that, but it's a whole day, morning, noon, and night, okay? I know some of you are morning people. Raise your hand if you're a morning person. Morning people in the room? Raise your hand if you're an evening person. Raise your hand if you're a napper because you haven't figured it out. That's me. I was like, I like to stay up, but then I get up early, and so I'm like, oh, I'll just take a nap. So the reality is, is where give God your best, so find that time, obviously, to spend with Him. That's assumed, okay? Carve out that time, but then this is ways to fill in the rest of your, of really your day. And so I just have some quick things. I'm going to read through these quickly. Just some quick, just quick pointers First, journal God's insights. Just journal God's insights. And I actually was thinking, like, I know that guys don't journal. Maybe they do. Do guys journal? Some of us. Not all of us. So I I was actually thinking of a guy in mind. Okay, listen. You have on your phone notes, right? Right? So if God says something to you, or you really hear God speaking through a passage, just click, like dictate into the phone that thought in your notes, and just keep it and save it. Pray scripture. If you don't know what to pray, just pray the passage that you're reading that day. Meditate. You know, I'm a demystify meditation. You know what meditation is? You just take a verse that you read in the morning, and just think about it all day, let it just Work through your brain as you think about all of life. Finally, study. Hey, I got a new diet for us all here, okay? The appetite of the laborers work for them. Their hunger drives them on. I want us to be so hungry for our time with God and His Word that it replaces some of the other hunger that we feel. So I got, I got, I got a diet for you. You want to hear my diet? Tonight... Or this whole week, when you just want to get out that like big bowl of ice cream and put on the chocolate sauce, the caramel sauce, maybe some crushed butterfinger on that thing. You know what I'm talking about. Big old Sunday. What if you got a hunger for God's word instead? And like take that time and just give it to Him. And just set aside maybe some of the, the physical hunger and hunger more for Him. Okay, morning, noon, and night, amen? Throughout our day, and we're going to keep talking about our secret life with God. What does it look like? And you know what's interesting is how God works, because I I knew I wanted to do a series on intimacy, but I didn't really talk to intimacy with God, and I didn't really talk to anybody about this. And then the Lord gave, in the middle of the night, Scott, just the words, like words to a song, like lyric. And then Danny put it to a melody. And, and here's what's so incredible. When you praise or listen to this song as they sing over us, you will hear just these, this main thought of Psalm 84 in this series. Just God has been giving us and preparing us for this series. And so I just want you just to hear this and listen as, uh, as they sing. Just how God is saying, this is what we need to be about. So thank you. Wake up in the morning. I don't know what the day brings. But you do, but you do. May not understand them, but your plans for me are perfect. I praise you, I praise you. This day is yours, this day is yours.
As the day unfolds around me, distractions tempt me to forget that you're right here. You're right here. So I lift my eyes to heaven. You are where my help comes from. Now I see you. Now I see you. gave him the words that we needed to hear and just confirming in our spirit what we need to be about. Amen? All right. This week, morning, noon, and night, every day, meet with the Father. The Holy Spirit shows up, and he will wipe out the inside of your cup, clean you out. Okay? He does the hard work. We have a prayer team that meets up front for your physical, emotional, or uh, spiritual healing. Please come forward. We have prayer cards in the chair in front of you. Please fill that out. We have a box. Put it at the connecting point. People will pray for you. Tonight, we have prayer at 6 o'clock. If you'd like to come, I'll pray. You'll be dismissed. Father, we are so thankful that this is work that happens just by just being close to you. It's not, it's not something that we have to somehow manufacture or, or it's not just changing behavior modification or something like that. No, it's just us meeting with you and as we meet with you more and more and more with a humble and teachable spirit, you will change us. You'll change everybody else around us because you've worked in our heart. I pray that you'll bless us. Lead us in guys. we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. I love you more than you know.
strong.